I wanted to start off before I say anything, bold or otherwise, and wave my hands a little bit and say there's data uh, to support some of the claims. Well, the claims that I'm making are supported by data. We have math models. We test hypotheses, just like chemists, uh, in, in, the, in the great tradition of Platt and so on. We have parameters in math models. We tweak conditions, predictable conditions, and see if the parameters respond in a valid way to test our hypotheses. Um, and we take into account, or we try to at least aspire to take into account, cumulative science, not only our own research from our lab, but from other labs as well. So I'm going to give you an advanced organizer. This is sort of the bottom line of what I'm going to say, and then I'm going to talk about it. But this is, this is really the message today. Uh, and that's that gist, uh, the essence of information is the key to understanding, that understanding is the key to science communication, and we have to think about how to structure opportunities for knowledge acquisition and infrastructure so it supports understanding and the extraction of gist. Whoops, my screen just went blank. Okay, how about that? It's here now. <laughs> All right, background. So that was the advanced organizer, and now we're going to talk about background. So what, first of all, we have to step back and say, what is the purpose of science communication? Well, it's to combat ignorance, suffering, and death. And you know, the, I know that's a lofty goal, but if you really think about it, in all the talks we've had, that's really the ultimate bottom line. That's the purpose of the communication. And then the question is, how do you reach that lofty goal? Well, you know, science provides us with crucial information. So as uh, uh, President Crow was just mentioning, Science allows us to plan and prepare for things that might happen. That's one of the uses of science that's very important. And it's very um, difficult for people psychologically to wrap their heads around things like risk and uncertainty because they haven't happened yet. They might happen, and the, and the, the losses, the costs are up front. So this is an intu a counterintuitive idea, this notion of risk. But it provides us as humans with the opportunity. There are some things that we do do in the name of science. We do vaccinate children. And we prevent things, not, not perfectly, and there's all kinds of problems, and I've done research on that, but we do vaccinate children, and we do prevent suffering and death as a result of planning um, by virtue of science. And also, I think it's important to, to remember that there are some fundamental questions that science helps us with, like who are we? Anthropologists address questions like that, or where did we come from? Cosmologists address questions like that, like the Big Bang and so on. And these fundamental questions about who are we and where do we come from, those are also important in terms of science communication. But what is the problem? There's a barrier, obviously, or we wouldn't be having this conference over a couple days. People have poor intuitions about science and about mathematics. Here's just some very familiar statistics about um, undereducation for problem solving among 15-year-olds. They have difficulty applying science concepts. We don't compare as favorably as we, as we uh, could. Um, if we had the achievement in science of Finland or places like Canada, we would, we would get a tremendous economic boon from that, according to estimates. You could debate the size of this $100 trillion. Maybe it's only $50 trillion. That's still a lot of money. Um, there's also, obviously, as been talked about before, and a lot of my work builds on, on uh, Kahneman, Tversky's work, and so on, that we have problems with concepts like probability and so on. These are counterintuitive. And the rate of innumeracy of people that don't have enough proficiency in numbers to understand numbers is epidemic. About 36% of adults in the US, according to representative samples, are unable to compute things like dosage for a child of medication by body weight. That's too complicated a math problem for 36% or 93 million adults to solve. So these are the kinds of, of barriers that we face. One of the things I think that we require, it's not an option, we require for a science of science communication that we have a model of the human mind, that it's the receiver of these messages we're trying to send. So those are three basic uh, constructs that come from my theory and, and are shared by others. Background knowledge, mental representations, and there's two types, just in verbatim, and I'm going to talk about that, and retrieval of principles and values that are applied to these mental representations. A lot of people have mentioned values. So values are invoked whenever we see important messages about any topic. Um, and then this enables us to use science to implement the science in our judgments and decisions, as was alluded to. So the bottom line of that message is we need more than knowledge. We need what I call insightful intuition, good intuitions as opposed to bad intuitions. 
So just to give you a little bit more specifics about my model uh, in nine minutes or less, um, on the one hand, whenever you get information or you experience events, you extract from that a precise, literal, just the facts kind of memory representation in your brain. At the same time, in parallel, you extract the gist or the bottom line essence or meaning of that message. So you do these two in parallel. Uh, so if you go to the doctor, for example, and this are two parents, and they're, about to, they're talking to the doctor about vaccination, and the doctor gives them a true fact that children of parents who refuse vaccination are 23 times more likely to, to get a disease. So you can encode 23 more times more likely, or you could say to yourself, gee, that's a huge increase in risk. I should do something about that. So the gist would be the huge increase in risk. So my, my point here, very simply, and my graphics are not nearly as sophisticated as, as Barbara's, but I have graphics. Uh, the idea is that, you know, we need help. Um, that, that science is really mediated by the human brain. The verbatim representation, the gist representation, it's not the message that goes directly into the brain and then acts on behavior. It's the interpretation of that message, how it's encoded, the mental representation. That's the key ingredient. And in particular, it's the gist. It's the, the, the processing of gist that, in fact, governs most of our decisions. And we, I base that based on experiments. And that's true for basic science and for health. So we have different kinds of representations that are based on different kinds of, of, of that, that, that different kinds of processing are drawn, drawn. So road analysis is based on verbatim representations. But advanced cognition, the kind that scientists and math mathematicians engage in, is actually based on this bottom line meaning, or gist. And I know that's counterintuitive. And we have lots of experiments to show that's the case. Um, so this differs from the standard dichotomy. So in education, you see a lot of battles about fuzzy math, that math versus basic skills, or sometimes it's called constructivism versus basic skills. So people oppose those two. But often, neither parts of the dichotomy include gist or meaning. How you think, or the scientific method, is often without scientific content. We're just going to teach people method, and we'll put the content off to later, right? And then the basic facts are memorized lists of, of strings of facts that have no coherence or understanding necessarily. And what I'm advocating is something different from that. I'm also advocating something beyond appeals to system one. I think emotion is very important, but I think we forget how often our understanding of the facts drives our emotional reaction to them. It's the take or the interpretation we have. I'm not saying emotion is unimportant. But I'm, not, I'm saying if we only oppose, uh, appeal to unreasoned emotion, I think we're going to lose the ultimate battle uh, for the minds as well as the hearts of people. So just requires knowledge and understanding, and that's what transfers and is retained over time. You don't remember the verbatim facts. As most Americans don't remember their high school science, but they remember concepts and intuitions from that science education. And that's what they invoke when they're on the job or when they're going to the voting booth. So what are the standard websites out there? And, and mostly I'm thinking about public health websites, which are very well-intentioned and have a lot of incredibly useful information, sort of like the information we talked about regarding Katrina. The, sometimes there's information out there, we're just not grasping it. Why? Because it's a list of jumbled facts that has no coherence to it. If you look at the anti-science websites, you often see a very coherent and compelling causal story. But you see the official websites, and often, that's lacking. It's not in context. That big why, that gist, is missing for people. So what's, what's my new approach? My, my, my well, bold, I guess you could call it bold. I guess we have to call it bold, <laughs> is harnessing uh, valid intuitions. So the idea is that we need to in, get people to have valid scientific intuitions, where they have a feel for the information. They have intuitions about what might be true beyond the facts, the limited number of facts that they learn. And in particular, we have, maybe you need to take a page from the book of the anti-science people. They work on the basis of, of threats to, uh, to uncertainty. So when people worry about things like autism, that creates a teachable moment because people are concerned about rises in autism. They're concerned about diseases that we don't know the causes of. They're concerned about things that might happen. So we have their attention. Then we have to fill that gap of the meaning threat with understanding. And unfortunately, in some of these cases, our understanding of etiology of disease is limited. But that's a vacuum that nature will fill, and it will fill with anti-science kinds of message. We have to be there with the kinds of mechanisms of science to, to compete with that on an on a, on a even playing field. 
So are there ever any practical examples of the implementation of GIST that actually worked? Yes, there's some examples that I and my colleagues have worked on. Real practical problems like how to prevent young teenagers from engaging in unprotected sex and putting themselves at risk of HIV transmission and premature pregnancy that limits their educational opportunities and so on. So we did a randomized trial of 807 teens. And the only change we made was we took a standard public health curriculum and we justified it. Meaning that at the end of every lesson, we wanted to make clear what's the bottom line? What's the essence? What does this mean to you, this communication? And we stress that. And those, uh, those effects on self-reported behavior lasted uh, a year. So a year later, they could remember the gist of the message and their behavioral intentions and their behaviors were significantly affected. They, they didn't engage in sex as often, et cetera, et cetera. So it affected their behavior as well as the way they represented information. We also recently completed um, um, uh, uh, an educational tool, a web-based automated intervention for arthritis drugs. Now, arthritis drugs are extremely complicated. When I first went, started on this project, I thought to myself, this is not going to be able to be justified. It's too hard. It's too complicated. These are disease-modifying drugs that have small probabilities of very, very bad consequences. But in fact, we took, in one session, in a web-based automated tutor that, that involved communicating the gist, we were able to increase value concordant informed decision making in real patients from 35% to 64%, which naturally is a significant increase. And there's other interventions that have been based on gist and this concept that we, uh, that's part of what we call fuzzy trace theory. The fuzzy traces are the gist traces that we think decision making is based on. So, what are the implications for infrastructure? Well, one of the, the points of leverage here is that GIST is not this incredibly long, you don't have to give someone a PhD necessarily to get the GIST. So it's a way to, in a more concentrated form, to, to address what is the need for information to make the decision, the answer to the question you asked before. What's the nub of the information that's functionally significant right now in my life that I need to know? So that's the GIST. And the current approaches we have really don't emphasize the gist. Uh, some approaches that are content-based, that have content, because in this approach you have to have science content. They have science content, but they don't have a theory of cognition. They base the cognition on opinion and the anecdote and that sort of thing, and that's incomplete. Uh, the cognition and communication people, people in my field, sometimes don't have the content, and they often don't stress meaning, believe it or not, despite the common sense idea that meaning would be at the center of communication, it's not at the center of most behavioral theories, oddly enough. And my idea here is that we should have a national lab or other mechanism to bring together science writers and researchers who are actually conducting research, that we put those people together. And I'm one of the believers that we need science writers to help us translate what we do. But I think it can't be, you know, hit and run kind of contact, but there's that depth is lacking. So I think there are successes in science communication. I'm going to flash these by you. There are times in which science education is successful. Uh, we were able to change the, 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 the Supreme Court no longer executes minors, and that's because of the research on the nature of the human brain and how it develops up to the age, you know, in the early 20s, it's still developing. And you may recognize this particular advertisement. This is based on research on the brain. Why do most 16-year-olds drive like they're missing a part of the brain? Because they are. So this has made an impact on the public. This is an effective science communication strategy. An eyewitness testimony would be another example. So um, these success stories were based on basic science with artificial materials in a lab. That's where they started. And they were able to be ultimately exported in real world environments that matter, like literally the death penalty. So again, like various people I've talked about, we want to tell stories, coherent narratives, but not just narratives that move people, but narratives that explain reality, that explain why, that cue our values so that they're relevant, and that integrate these facts rather than just list them. And we want deeper, not dumber. <laughs> Take a page. And this notion about films and so on being part of this is something that, uh, as a result of a literature uh, review that I wrote in 2006 about adolescent risk taking, I also concurred at the time that films and stories and novellas and things like that would be a wonderful vehicle to transmit these kinds of gist. So the message is the big why. People comprehend and retain the gist of information, not the list of facts. Coherent explanatory narratives are ideal for conveying that in various formats. 
Just representations are what people use when they make judgments and decisions, and it's the answer to the question, what's the bottom line of the message? What do I need to know to make decisions? And you recognize that. Thank you. Thank you.